Just the word research can be so intimidating. And as you have learned throughout your, your courses, it doesn't have to be because once we break it down, it becomes a very logical process of things to do in order to find the truthful answer to your research question. So let's take a look at this whole project and how you might best think about approaching it. First, let's talk about exactly what research is. A systematic process of what? Collecting data and then compiling the data that you collected, the analysis of the data that was collected, the interpretation of the results of the analysis, and then the application. How can we use this knowledge gained from this analysis and these results to improve the, the situation, to find a solution to a problem, to find out if it's even really a problem at all? This is so important that we do this to help make healthcare more efficient and effective. So now you need to think about what type of research will you be doing? There are two types of research, primary research and secondary research. Primary research, which is what you will be doing for your capstone project, is the plan, the collection of original data and then for a specific purpose and then analyzing that data. Secondary research, which I'm sure you've done a thousand times in all of your other classes, this is a collection of data that has already been collected by other people for other purposes, and then you are analyzing it in a new way. So you've already done so much secondary research, that's why here in the capstone, we want you to conduct a primary research proposal. You will not actually be doing the research, you're just planning it out. Now, as we look at the methodologies for your research, again we have two choices, quantitative and qualitative. Quantitative has its emphasis on the collection of numerical data, while qualitative is the gathering of words, of feelings, in, in interpretations, opinions. Not qualitative, not quantifiable, not numerical. Once you know whether you want to do a quantitative or a qualitative research study, you must take the next step to define and describe specifically what data will you collect? Quantitative data, examples such as what was the temperature of the patient when they were admitted into the emergency department? What were the glucose levels of the patients at the clinic? How many patients do we have that have been diagnosed with, I don't know, disease, injury, condition, whatever it is that you're going to be studying? How many patients actually use the patient portal and for what purposes? Or how many physicians are using CPOE, computerized physician order entry software? These are just examples of things that you would collect or study with quantitative numerical data. Qualitative data, on the other hand, can be a little more complex it's easy to collect because you would interview people and write down or record their words, but then you have to analyze them. So I'm going to give you a hint. There is a way to convert qualitative data, opinions, feelings, and other words, and translate them into numerical data by using a, collect, a data collection tool that uses a Likert type scale. Now you may not know what a Likert type scale is, but I'll bet you you have filled out a survey or completed an evaluation that uses one. 
The Likert type scale is one where there is a statement provided and then the participant is given, oh, I don't know, say five choices for an answer, usually one through five, where one is significantly disagree and five is significantly agree. Or it might be one is very unsatisfied, where five is very satisfied. You know what I'm talking about now, right? This is an excellent way where you can collect qualitative data and convert it at the same time into numerical data, which will make it easier for you to analyze. Just trying to make this whole thing less pressure. Okay, so now that you know exactly what data you're going to collect, you have to determine how you are going to collect it. What tools will you use? The most common are questionnaires, where you hand somebody a piece of paper, or it can be done online, like with SurveyMonkey or something like that. Interviews, which are typically face-to-face, -face, although you can use technology for an interview using something like Skype or FaceTime. And documentation review, which would be pulling reports from a source, such as the electronic health records regarding a patient's uh, diagnosis or a uh, number of times they've gone to therapy or whatever it is, again, that you're looking for. Now, as you're in the process of collecting data, you must make certain that you collect enough data to ensure that your results will be valid, to ensure that your results will be statistically significant. And this is very, very important. Otherwise, you're doing this whole thing for nothing. Okay, so you have a link here at the bottom of the screen that will give you information about determining confidence intervals and confidence levels. But before you go there, you must know your total population. So for example, if you want to investigate how many patients in, in uh, an inpatient hospital ward that had asked for uh, seeing the chaplain, okay, the first thing you need to know is how many beds there are so you can determine the total number of patients and then therefore track how many have asked to see the chaplain. So you must begin with total population. If you're not certain how to find this information, then please ask your instructor. Now for the confidence level and the confidence interval, this is kind of like your error range. I'm sure you've seen statistics and poll information that have said like plus or minus five or plus or minus three. That's telling you that once you have the information, the results from the analysis of your sample size, the idea of this is to extrapolate it to the entire population. But there may be a variance in how accurate that is. And that's what your confidence level and your confidence intervals are going to tell you. So make sure you read up, it's just like a paragraph or two, and it'll tell you and you'll be able to do this correctly. This must be completely identified in your proposal. Now, while you're thinking about all of these things, like the specific data and how you're gonna collect it and how much, how big your sample size is, you want to continually be considering the purpose of the study. What do you hope to identify? What do you hope to prove or disprove? What do you hope you can contribute to the quality of care being provided at your organization, to the delivery of care being provided to your community, or to patient outcomes, which is always the most important. Once you have collected all of the data and organized it, 
The next step is to analyze it. Now, there are lots of different analysis tools, and man, this is so great that we get to do this in, in post-technology era because now we have software programs that can actually do the math for us. So, first, you have to decide what formula or what process are you going to analyze the the data to get the answer you're looking for. One of the easiest and most popular is Microsoft Excel. But just saying you're going to use Excel is not enough information. First, you need to review the descriptions of all the different formulas so you can identify which formula or formulas you will use in order to get the results you need to activate and that's my term for actually using the results of your research to promote improvement in your healthcare organization. SPSS is another very common software program, and there are more which you can find by following the link that I provided. But you have to understand what each one does what the angle or the perception of the analysis is to ensure that you're going to get usable analysis results for what you need. Last but not least, once you have your results, we look to interpret the results and create a presentation to those with whom we work such as the board of directors or the executive committee or whoever it might be where you are going to take the results and you're going to illustrate to them using charts and graphs and tables to illustrate the results of your study. Did the results confirm or deny what you were thinking? Did the, did the results give you a yes positive, a no negative, or a maybe, maybe we can't tell. Whatever the results are, they are value, they have value to you and your uh, organization and your community and your industry. This is one of the many ways that health informatics and health information management professionals are involved in improving the healthcare industry. I hope there were some points included in this presentation that stir your creative thinking, that stir your critical thinking. Maybe you've come up with more questions than answers. Well, that's great because we, your instructors, Love it when you ask us questions. So whatever you're thinking, whatever you want confirmation on, whatever you want to talk through, please ask your instructor.